Association of Structural Engineers, also known as IASTRUCT E, was conceptualized and constituted in the year 2002 by a group of senior professional structural engineers from all over the country. IASTRUCT E is registered under the Society's Registration Act 21 of 1860. IASTRUCT E is a national apex body of structural engineers in India with a mission to promote structural engineering profession and cater to the professional needs of the structural fraternity. In the short span of two decades, association has attained an eminent position in the professional field. Its membership is valued very highly in the profession. Since inception, IAS Structi has been led by eminent structural engineers like late Sri Mahindra Raj, late Sri Sri Kumar Ghosh, Sri Subhash Chand Mehrotra, Professor Mahesh Tandran, Sri Alok Bhomik, Sri Manoj Mittal, and Professor R. Pradeep Kumar as its president. IA Structi is a permanent member of Engineering Council of India and interacts with the government on professional and policy matters related to civil and structural engineers. To expand its reach, IA Structi has collaboration with various international professional like-minded associations and institutions. IA Structi's prime objective is supporting and protecting the profession of structural engineering by upholding professional standards and acting as a mouthpiece for structural engineers in India. IA Structi endeavor to ensure that its members develop the necessary skill in structural engineering and work to the highest standards by maintaining a commitment to professional ethics and standards. IA Struct is actively engaged in organizing several continuing professional development CPD courses for structural engineers to help them update their knowledge and advance their career paths. It also conducts refresher courses for young and practicing engineers and student-oriented programs, seminars, workshops, conferences, technical lectures and discussions related to the latest technological advancements and case studies are also organized regularly for members to enable them to continuously update their knowledge and skill set by interacting with the best minds from the industry. IAS Structi's activities are widely appreciated and known for quality technical contents. IA Structi is also actively engaged in publishing its quarterly journal Structural Engineering Digest SED, code commentaries, professional guidelines and a monthly newsletter. IA Structi's publications are becoming popular with time. IA Structi has representation in various technical committees of BIS and IRC as well. Its members are actively contributing to National Code of Formulations in the year 2020, IA Structi started national awards competition to stimulate interest in the structural engineering field and to promote innovative thinking and creativity. The awards are presented to the winners in recognition of their outstanding contribution to structural engineering in the categories which include Outstanding Structure, Outstanding Structural Engineer, Outstanding Woman Structural Engineer, Promising Young Structural Engineer and Best Master's Thesis in Structural Engineering. IA Struct E is currently operating from four regional centers namely Eastern, Western, Northern and Southern having its headquarters in Delhi to inculcate the professional culture and provide handholding to the budding engineers. IA Structi has its student chapters in several leading engineering institutions as well. Membership of IA Structi is open to all civil and structural engineers engaged in structural engineering profession. Members are elected based on their qualifications and experience in different grades as per eligibility requirements prescribed in the bylaws. Each application is carefully scrutinized before electing the members. More information about IA Struct E is available on its website www.iastructe.co.in. Uh, hello. Yes, Dhan sir. Uh, my wife is audible? Yes, yes. 
so dear friends welcome to the webinar indian association of structural engineers is organizing uh, uh, such monthly lectures every month uh, today we have a webinar <laughs> on structural assessment repair and rehabilitation of a 64 year old rail cum road bridge at bokoma in bihar the speakers today are mr log bhumi and mr subantra sen gupta first i will introduce mr log bhumi uh, he is an eminent bridge engineer with exceptional records and achievements having over 42 years of experience in the field of bridge and structural engineers he graduated from dc now called dtu in 1981 and uh, started working and during service he did his mtech from iit delhi in 1992 he is a fellow of national academy of engineering and a fedic certified consulting practitioner <laughs> he is also an international professional engineer of institution of engineers india he is the recipient of 24th sb joshi memorial award for the year 2018 for his excellence bridge structural engineering he is a committee member of various committees in bsi and indian road congress he is a governing council member of indian sector engineer and he is currently chairman publication committee and professional issues committee of indian association of sector engineers regarding mr sumantra gupta he is uh, present working as deputy director technical in bns engineering consultants private limited and heading uh, this unit at calcutta he has over 31 years of experience in the consultancy field and he has worked in various important and prestigious projects his field of specialization is seismic analysis and design of bridge structures he is the past member of the road congress b5 committee for steel and composite structures regarding the brief of the topic this is a siberia bridge at makama bihar is a rail cum road bridge across river ganga constructed in the year 1959 it was the first bridge in the the northern and southern portions of the state of bihar east central railways desired to strengthen and upgrade this bridge to take up 25 uh, ton 2008 irs loading for the railways and latest indian road congress loading for the roadway in this presentation speakers will describe the background and history of the old bridge structural scheme of the bridge and detailed procedures adopted for assessment and the structural intervention proposed to be adopted the procedure adopted will include assessment of structural strength estimation of demand estimation of capacity and fatigue assessment and diagnosis of the cause of distress now i request the speakers to proceed mr bhumik thank you uh, thank you dr dhawan am i audible yes thank you thank you so uh, 
let me start sharing my screen. Is my screen visible now? Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to this presentation. Uh, before I start this presentation, I have two important uh, but brief points which I would like to mention. Firstly, uh, let me uh, thank Dr. Dhawan, who has been continuously holding the fort for this monthly technical lectures, which is being organized by IES Trakti for the last 15 years. He is actually organizing this monthly technical lectures and uh, he's still continuing this task. Uh, if you all know the background of Dr. Dhawan, some of you may not be aware, but let me just tell you a very interesting story of his you know, career path. He started his career way back in 1961 uh, uh, after completing his ITI uh, and he joined in CPWD as a draftsman in 1961. But he completed uh, his AMI in 1965 and became a uh, engineer. Subsequently, in 1971, he completed his Indian uh, engineering services and became a class one officer. In 1982, he completed his MTech from IIT Delhi. Uh, he did his master's in uh, management of urban development from Birmingham University, UK in 87-88. And then he did his MPhil in project management in 1995. He retired from CPWD in 2003, joined PhD in IIT Delhi in 2013, 10 years after retirement, and he's completed his PhD in 2019 at the age of 77. So, uh, you know, hats off to this gentleman who is, who is uh, you know, whose career path is, I think, an example for others to sort of emulate. Uh, I just thought that, you know, uh, uh, this is, uh, we should talk about Dr. Dhawan and his achievements also before I start. The second point which I wanted to briefly mention is about the uh, IES Trakti's initiatives in last one year, which has not been captured in that video, which uh, you people have uh, uh, watched. There are three aspects in which IES Trakti has taken lead in last three, one year. One is uh, about a magazine uh, which is called Newsletter, a quarterly newsletter which is called Crossfall, which reports confidentially these, uh, about the structural failures and the lessons learned. Uh, I have spoken about Crossfall in many forums. Uh, I would request all the participants uh, who witness any failure to uh, report. If you want to know more details about Crossfall, kindly go through the website of IES Trakti and get the details. But we look forward to participation of uh, engineers who are involved in day-to-day -day in structural engineering. And if they witness any uh, failure or any near misses, and if that is reported, it will help the engineering fraternity to learn lessons from others' failure rather than uh, committing the same themselves. Second uh, is uh, about the membership of FIB. Uh, the IES Trakti is the statutory member of FIB and a national member group, and that is a big boost uh, for IES Trakti. And this will enable the members of IES Trakti to get a lot of benefits as a, a part of the FIB membership because all the technical bulletins, all the uh, you know model codes that is going to come out or the past uh, bulletins that uh, uh, the members will have access to. Besides that, they uh, they will be having access to become a member of the task group committees and the commissions of FIB, uh, and they can address themselves in the international fora. And the third is about uh, initiation on uh, professional accreditation uh, drive that uh, IS Trakti has taken up. And I think on that also, we have held several uh, orientation programs and webinars. And so these are the three things which I thought, you know, I would like to flag before we actually start the presentation. 
this is a, a joint presentation by me and my co-presenter uh, sumantra so this is the broad content of our presentation uh, uh, mr sen gupta will cover basically item number uh, partly item number 5 and 6 when it comes to the uh, uh, calculation of um, remaining fatigue service life of the bridge and also the structural interventions proposed and uh, i will cover the rest so let me uh, begin with the uh, you know presentation on 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 the first part which is the uh, background and history uh, there was no bridge existing uh, when this bridge was conceived in way back in 1946 there was no bridge uh, from uh, varanasi to uh, you know uh, this harding bridge which is in Bang now bangladesh at that time it was it was uh, basically a part of india and this entire 1000 kilometer uh, ganga was not uh, having any uh, sort of uh, crossing and the distance between these two is about 1000 kilometers and bihar was completely uh, uh, sort of you know divided by ganga into two parts which is the northern part and the southern part where in the northern part of bihar uh, there were so many uh, streams which is joining from the himalayas to the ganga and during the monsoon season the entire area was used to be flooded and that was main reason why the development in the northern part of bihar was very very uh, limited uh, so the a bit of idea about these two bridges the malavia bridge which is at which was at varanasi which was constructed in 1887 was a rail come road bridge and the hardinge bridge was uh, 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 constructed in 1915 this was only a rail bridge uh, and this is what i was just mentioning about the you know uh, north bihar and south bihar and while the north bihar was uh, very very less developed uh, but the south bihar was uh, flourishing because it had all the benefits of the river but uh, all the floods and other uh, uh, climatic uh, you know distress was in the northern part of bihar uh, the mokama bridge was uh, conceived in the year 1946 prior to independence and uh, this uh, job was assigned to mr m j hempton who was appointed by the railway board to investigate uh, to do the feasibility and to locate the best site for the bridge uh, the uh, the next bridge which actually came after this mokama was uh, this uh, mahatma gandhi setu in 1982 so between 1959 and 1982 this was the only connection in bihar uh, So, uh, Mr. Hempton, who was appointed in 1947, uh, he submitted the project report after one year in 1947. Uh, the site uh, which he chose was also later confirmed by hydraulic model study, which was conducted at Pune Hydrodynamic Research Station. Uh, I think now it is called uh, CWPRS Pune. The government of India appointed after once the uh, alignment was finalized, the government of India appointed Sir M. Vishweshwaraya to review and approve the bridge site. And uh, they created a, a, a special purpose vehicle which is called Ganga Bridge Project. And this was formed to carry out the whole uh, construction. Uh, before they this Ganga bridge project or this SPV a floated, floated tenders for the bridge. The project involved several works like, you know, the river training works, the building of approach roads with earth embankment, production works, etc. So all this uh, work took uh, up till 1954. So from 1947 to 1954, all this paid work was done before the tenders were floated for uh, this uh, 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 particular bridge. <clears throat> uh, then January 1954, the uh, global tenders were called. Uh, 
the idea was to have a rail come road bridge with rail at the bottom and uh, road above uh, in the tender the department the ganga bridge project spv they had a departmental design and drawings as and they permitted alternate design that was the trend at that time it was a lump sum contract the, but there was a design given by the department for execution if they want to follow that otherwise the contractor was uh, allowed to do a alternative design also uh bbj and hcc joint venture uh, they decided to bid jointly for this project hindustan construction had experience of doing well foundation and therefore they they were they had the expertise for the foundation whereas pbj um, was having expertise in the uh, superstructure uh, steel bridges steel trusses and therefore a combination of hcc bbj was ideally suited as a as a indian uh, you know contract construction team so they uh, they in fact uh, bid and they became the l1 they came out with two three alternatives themselves out of which the alternative number 3 design and they engaged for the pre bid as well as post bid freeman fox and partners a organization a very well reputed organization from a british organization uh and freeman fox and partners came out with two three alternatives and they followed the third alternative and uh, it became uh, the l1 uh, interestingly there were 20 bidders and uh, hcc bbj were the lowest bidder the next uh, bid l2 was just 7% higher the work for the bridge started in october 1954 and it was ready uh, and for rail traffic by 1959 february this bridge was inaugurated by uh, pandit jawaharlal nehru the first prime minister and what you see that uh, in the slide is a table which i picked up from one of the article uh, which uh, gives the three alternatives that uh, that was done by uh, freeman fox and partners for the contractor and it gives you relative quantities uh, and steel required and uh, i don't want to go into great detail but that article gives a lot of details as to why alternative 3 despite the fact that it was uh, in terms of tonnage it is higher than alternative 2 but why the contractor preferred alternative three purely from the overall cost because of the construction was easy and the construction cost was coming lower so overall costing was lower for alternative three that is why they chose alternative number three uh so this is the uh, final uh, bridge which was uh, it looks so uh, you know pure and excellent photograph so i thought i'll show this photograph also now Uh, let me give a little brief about you know all these informations where from i gathered and i'm presenting before you uh when we got the job on behalf of the contractor to do this repair you know uh, study or structural audit then uh, we were given all the uh, as built drawing which was produced by the railways railways had the copies of the as built drawings they had nothing else but the as built wrong drawings were very very informative very useful i'll come to that later but uh, i was desperately searching for some more documents uh, which gives you salient uh, details and i uh, consulted mr amitabh ghoshal because amitabh ghoshal sir is is well known uh, is a doyen in our uh, in our country and i think he had lot of experience of bridges built by bbj he is a he is also he also worked in bbj so he had a lot of knowledge about the bridges those days he is he has given many expert lectures on howrah bridge so i contacted him whether there is any information about bokama bridge he said that he doesn't have the information but he says that the, probably there can be a paper published in institution of civil engineers uk and if we can get access to that paper perhaps we will get some information and he also helped me by giving contact detail of the person in charge in india uh, representing institution of civil engineers uk that is mr uh, ayanang shudde and uh, uh, 
uh, he gave me his contact number. I contacted him, and next day morning, I see in my email a paper, two papers rather, on this bridge, which was published in 1960. And these two papers, which I'm projecting here, had excellent information about the nitty gritties of the bridge design as well as construction, and it helped us a great deal in dealing with the uh, you know uh, the uh, work of repair and rehabilitation every small small detail was also there and the paper including the discussion was written in a manner uh, which is like a story book uh, a few more uh, information about the uh, about the uh, you know as built drawings which we have received I learned a lot by going through these as-built drawings produced by the contractor at that time in 60s. And uh, uh, we have been in the profession for last 40 years. I have been working in the last 40 years. I have completed many projects and given as-built drawings, but I have never seen uh, that an as-built drawing contains so much of information. There were about 40 drawings which was handed over to us. So some of the drawings, for example, the drawing which I am showing you, it has a chart of uh, stress, the bending moments, the stresses in each and every component of the truss, a typical truss, and the stress level, the loads due to dead load, live load, wind load, seismic load, everything right from the stringer bracing to the main cord element, diagonal bracings, every information is there available in this one sheet which was produced. I'm just giving one example. There are 40 such sheets, and this is what they call as built drawing. Uh, this is another sample which I have picked up. You can see, and like that, for each and every uh, foundation and substructure, they have drawing, which tells you the important dates when the well curve was grounded, when the well cap was cast. Entire, all the dates are mentioned over here. What was the tilt? What was the shift? All these informations are built into the as-built drawing. And uh, I, was, I was very impressed to see this. Uh, in the paper, I got some information about the cost of the original bridge. Uh, the total cost of the bridge was 5 crores, uh, which comes to roughly about 30,000 rupees per running meter. This is just for the information because uh, we can compare it with today's cost. Uh, the weight of steel work uh, for Mokama Bridge was 2.25 tons per square feet uh, of the bridge for 120 meter span. And this is uh, compared to, at that time, the contractor and the designer, they compared before putting the tender with the existing bridges those times. One was the Harding Bridge, which was having double uh, rail. So it was 3.6 ton per square feet for 105 meter span with a double track rail bridge built in 1917. And then the Willington Bridge, which is today we call it Bali Bridge. Uh, the weight of steel work was 6.9 ton per square feet for 107 meter span with two tracks of railway. 5.5 meter wide road on top. It's a rail come road in 90, built in 1931. And this comparison uh, gave them the confidence that the Bokama bridge design was masterly improvement over other bridges constructed in the past. And therefore, this, this kind of comparative study was done before the tender was, uh, you know, uh, submitted. Uh, this is just a embossment in the bridge when we visited the site we picked up the steel work supply erection by bbj construction work order is dated 1954 the bridge is designed for irs loading a bg standard of 1926 and the roadway on top was designed for irc loading single lane class double a or two lane of class a at that time 70 r wheel was not there in 1954 when this bridge was designed uh, this is a typical view uh, at the road level, and uh, you can see it's a double uh, warrant truss, and you can see from the road, the road is at the middle, and so therefore the look of the bridge 
if you if you are at the road looks like a single warren truss if you go to the bottom then you will also look it looks like a single warren but if you see the elevation it is a double warren bridge this is from the uh, bottom level the rail level it's a single track as you can see uh presently there are two adjacent bridges which are coming up one is the railway bridge on the upstream side which is very adjacent to the existing mokama bridge this is being uh, uh, constructed by ircon who subcontracted it to afcons it is for railway only not rail come road and it is for two tracks the expected completion date is 2025 and the cost estimated is about 1500 crores which comes to about 87 lakhs per running meter there is a parallel highway bridge which is coming up which is six lane which is called antar samaria extra dose bridge which is uh, con being constructed by sp singla construction which is also in progress and the project cost of this six lane uh, highway is 1161 crores so uh, once these two bridges are constructed the uh, existing old mokama bridge will be significantly relieved of the load both from the highway side as well as from the rail side so as such the importance of this bridge is uh, really short lived uh it 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 is uh, next 5 years 4 5 years and after that there is opportunity to reduce the loading uh in terms of the roadway loading we will come to that later uh, based on our findings uh now we come to the next part which is the salient feature of the of the project uh as this is a 14 uh, span bridge and uh 14 spans of 122 meter i mean in terms of feet it is 397 feet and uh, you have the shore spans of 30 around 33 meter 32.5 meter two spans each on both side so total length is about 1721 meter uh, you can see the uh, enlarged elevation of the uh, of the bridge and this is a double warren uh, trust bridge with road at the intermediate level you can just see that uh just for the information of uh, those who are uninitiated on the on the on the type of truss what we have are different type of trusses and you can see this is the warren truss which is uh, single this is warren truss with vertical and what is being followed is a double warren truss uh, uh, which is also having verticals so this is what is uh, followed for mokama bridge and uh, in terms of the economy i mean with double war intersection war and trust the rail come road bridge uh, uh, the total uh, tonnage of steel was minimum all the option studies were done at that time by freeman fox and partners as a matter of fact even within the double intersection war and trust they worked out the various possible heights uh currently uh, this bridge had a difference in the lever arm of about 60 feet between the bottom cord and the top cord they uh, tried many alternatives and they found that the most opt in terms of the cost the most optimum was 70 feet but they realized that with 70 feet the uh, member size member weight for cantilever constructions were little higher and that would have increase the cost of their cantilever construction so when they do the overall costing they found that 60 feet though in terms of the tonnage it was about 2% more in terms of tonnage but it was helping to reduce the uh, the you know uh, it, it made it easier the construction using cantilever construction technique this is the uh, 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 general arrangement detail you can see the elevation and uh, as i mentioned the truss depth was 60 feet and the uh, roadway was around 30 feet above the rail level there are verticals which are connected up to the up to the uh, center this vertical was not continued above in plan at the top level there is these are the lateral bracings at the bottom level uh, at the st stringer level you have plan bracing as well as at the bottom of the truss you have the bracings and uh, you know he, uh, one more issue i want to flag here is 
that because it's a single uh, track bridge, the spacing between the truss was only 29 feet, which was sufficient for the two-lane carriageway on top. It was decided on the basis of the uh, of the roadway. Uh, for the railway, we, it could have been further reduced. But this spacing of 29 feet for a span of uh, 397 feet or uh, 121 meter, the span by width ratio is rather too large. And that uh, created a little bit of problem in design and that increased the sizes a little bit, but then there was not much of an option. Had it been a two rail, probably the uh, cost optimization could have been done much better. That's 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 what is reported in the in the in the article written by uh, the members of BBJ and uh, the contractor and Freeman Fox and Partners. So these are uh, some of the details of the bracings uh, photographs. Uh, I don't want to get into much detail, but these are some of the photographs which demonstrates you know how, what is the arrangement. Uh, just one point here that you see. At the rail, because of the envelope of the clearances, uh, and since the width was more, as I mentioned, it, the width was governed by the roadway. So it was possible to give this kind of inclined uh, portal at the rail level, and that helped to reduce the uh, uh, the size of the cross girder. You can see the cross girder is basically having a span which is reduced, and that helped to optimize also the design. Uh, these are the details of the superstructure for, for finer details of the bottom cord and it was there are four types of uh, categories of you know components the outer to outer of the angle was kept constant all through for standardization the only variation was in the plate thickness and plate size and that helped to standardize the connection details significantly this is uh, the bottom cord exactly similar con concept uh, these are the diagonals. These are the end verticals. I, I'm just quickly running through that because uh, basically, you know, uh, we, we will focus more on the uh, uh, rehabilitation that we want to do. Uh, structural arrangement at road level is given here. You can see that on the top of the, uh, uh, of the cross girder, the roadway cross girder, there are, it's a composite deck slab, deck, RCC deck with steel concrete composite deck. There are five uh, longitudinal stringers which are connected to the deck slab for a composite action. And the footpath is separate, which is in the cantilever portion outside the truss. So there are footpaths on both sides and the uh, uh, the uh, carriageway, uh, vehicular carriageways are at the center. Uh, at the rail level, uh, the rail is directly uh, sitting over the rail uh, stringers, railway stringers. So yeah, uh, the, the 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 rail is connected directly to the stringer. Stringer is uh, bolted or riveted rather to the cross girder on one end. On the other end, there is a slotted hole. It's a fixed and free arrangement for the uh, rail stringer, uh, which in turn is supported between the cross girders. Uh, as far as the road is concerned, the expansion joints are provided at uh, you know at every third point. That means the span is one twenty meter around so around every 40 meter there is an expansion joint uh, uh, which is also another point of discussion while which we found out during the during the study uh, we will explain that later longitudinal loads in the stringer from the braking and traction and earthquake or uh, wind are transmitted to the bottom cords of the main truss by braking uh, girders or bracing system in every panel uh, on the railway stringer uh, the lateral loads due to the transverse wind or seismic is captured by the bearings, fixed bearings on one end and the free bearing on the other end of the of the main truss. Uh, we will discuss about that also later. Uh, this is a typical arrangement of the uh, of the uh, you know uh, stringer at the rail level. You can see this is the cross girder. The cross section is the cross girder. So every uh, stringer is fixed at one end and it is free uh, to expand at the other end. So it's a simply supported. And this concept uh, continues for all the stringers except for the central one. The central cross girder has fixity of the stringer. Central cross girder has, uh, you know, the stringers are 
fixed at both ends and that created a little bit of problem at site and uh, there were cracks in the interestingly in all the 14 spans the central cross girder had some problems when we went into the uh, details and we found out the reason as to the arrangement fixity arrangement itself caused the problem as far as the motor rail property is concerned high tensile steel is used for the entire main truss element steel was all imported from uk since sufficient quantity of high tensile steel was not available in india reportedly uh, the steel breach code does not permit use of welding for high tensile steel hence uh, they used the rivets and all the rivets are high tensile rivets the floor systems are uh, of mild steel uh, and therefore they are all built up welded section all cross girders and singers at rail and road level for the shore span that is four shore spans 30 around 30 meter on both sides two spans each they are of course riveted but not the main bridge the main bridge the stringers and the cross girders are welded whereas the main truss element which is of high tensile steel are riveted this is the bearing arrangement for the main truss as i mentioned it is fixed at one end all the both the bearings are fixed under the truss sorry sorry both the bearings are fixed under the truss and on the other side there you have this uh, longitudinal guided bearing or free bearing you call it uh, but uh, you know in this arrangement during the lateral transverse seismic and wind there is a huge longitudinal force which is generated in the fixed bearing because the lever arm was only 29 feet and that uh, caused other than the braking force and other uh, longitudinal forces caused due to temperature the conventional forces that we take these bearings also take about uh, you know 200 250 tons of lateral load caused due to uh, seismic and wind because of the fixity and the reduced lever arm and this has been estimated at that time itself and it is catered for these are the some photographs of the bearings that it as it exists for the 30.5 meter span shore span and these are the Unfortunately, the photograph is not very clear on the bearing. These are for the main span. What you see is only the, the bottom grillage uh, on the bearing and not the main bearing. Uh, the bearing is somehow we didn't get proper photographs. This is the arrangement of the substructure and super uh, and the well foundation. It's a double D well. You can see that various cross sections are given here. And on top of the double D well, this is or the well is made of uh, PCC, uh, M, uh, you know, it's a volumetric uh, mix. And on top of that, you have uh, RCC uh, circular pier, uh, two twin pier, and with a uh, with a solid pier in the bottom portion. Uh, plan dimension of the foundation: nine point seven by sixteen meter, depth fifty five meter. Bottom plug is 1 is to 3 is to 6, tinning M12 and M20, uh, equivalent. When I say equivalent, because those days they used to take cylinder strength, well cap is M20 equivalent. Substructure, RCC twin column 4.57 uh, meter dia and concrete grade is M20. Uh, what is interesting, I we gathered from the article, is that this well foundation was designed for possible pneumatic sinking should there be a need although this need never arise but uh, they because of the layers of clay the designer anticipated that there may be a possibility when pneumatic sinking needs to be done so therefore the design catered for pneumatic sinking and for that pressure the screening has been designed uh, this is the uh, you know a, a photograph which i took from that article uh, of the cantilever erection of the main truss and uh, I am told that uh, completion of this cantilever erection uh, of each span was hugely celebrated at site because it was unique uh, bridge, not many bridges of this type at that uh, period, period, you know, was, was constructed. So every cantilever construction after success was celebrated uh, at, at, at site. Uh, 
Fortunately, the railway codes were available. IRS, IRS code, Indian Railway Standard codes were available at that time. As you can see, uh, the bridge rules uh, started in 1941. The substructure code was available in 1936. And the welding code and the steel, steel code was also available. So therefore, the entire design was based on uh, IRS codes. But uh, from the article, what I gathered is the designer being a British, Freeman, Fox and Partners, they compared their design at every step with the British code BS153 and they made their comparison also in that article very clearly as to how British code compares with the, the, the railway code, uh, you know, in terms of the impact. And that was a very interesting part of the of the article, you know, which I found. Coming to the history of repair and rehabilitation carried out in the past, uh, we, we also, uh, you know, interacted with railways, the East, East Central Railway, and tried to find out what has been done in the past. And we uh, understood that uh, the East Central Railway in 2010 carried out some repair and their repair was based on inspection there was no analytical uh, you know auditing as such done so based on the inspection some part is in distress they used to replace like that so in 2010 they uh, they did uh, some components were you know uh, repaired replaced or rehab uh, strengthened and this gives the details but if you can see that most of it is from the short span and for the main span, the existing cross gutter webs were strengthened, uh, but as such, uh, not much. Then in 2011, they uh, engaged uh, SCRC Chennai, CSIR SCRC Chennai, to do a more organized uh, structural audit. And um, at that time, they also informed that since 1992, there were a lot of uh, uh, problems they encountered in the gazettes of the of the roadway portal and also some cracks uh, appeared uh, in the junction between the uh, inclined portal and the cross girder uh, of the roadway uh, slab. And all these things came to light and uh, detailed investigation was carried out by CSIR. Uh, probably they did some analytical study also, but they also did uh, some instrumentation and vibration study. And uh, they uh, identified one of the reasons for distress in that portal uh, was the involve uh, the presence of expansion joint in the middle, because the detailing of the uh, of the stringers at the roadway level uh, did not justify presence of expansion joint of the, of the, at the deck level, and therefore there were some forces which were coming, which uh, created a lot of torsion at the portal which is supporting at the expansion joint location, and only those portals had. Uh, Serious, uh, serious problems. So their suggestion was to sort of make it a continuous uh, from end to end of the pier rather than put expansion joints in between. And at the same time, they said that till such time at the expansion joint locations, change the portal from an eye girder to a box girder, which has better torsional resistance. These were the recommendations of CSIR, uh, SERC, but it was not implemented in total. Uh, and the East, uh, the East Central Railway uh, did their own, uh, with their own logic and their own wisdom, they uh, did not go for the box, uh, you know, uh, uh, frame, rather they strengthened the the portal, uh, you know, cross girder by uh, web plating and all. So these are uh, some of the, uh, some of the figures taken from the SCRC report which demonstrates the, the extent of investigation and the analytical study which they have done uh, to justify uh, what they, they have actually done. They have done a lot of vibrational measurements also, which uh, proved that those particular portals had more large vibrations as compared to the other portals. Uh, so this is what I was just mentioning, that the proposed cross girder was a box, but original cross girder was I. But this was not implemented by ECR. Uh, many of the suggestions were implemented, but not this one. Uh, so as on date, uh, ECR, uh, uh, you know, uh, did 
some uh, improvement or uh, repairs which is highlighted here. Uh, main span rail cross girder, you can see in this photograph that, uh, uh, you know, strengthening of the web of the main cross girder. Uh, I don't know whether it is visible. This part you can see it is uh, that's plated by rivets. Uh, so strengthening has been done by them. Now, uh, at this point, they uh, engaged last year in 2022, uh, since SP Singla construction was, uh, was given this task of uh, repair, and rehabilitation and strengthening of the bridge. And SP Singla in turn uh, engaged B&S engineering consultants. So the contract detail for the repair strengthening was following that the project is uh, strengthening has to be completed in 24 months and the cost was 67 crores. And the scope included assessment of the requirement of extent of uh, retrofitting, strengthening, uh, superstructure steel work of typical one span of 18 meter, 30 meter and 121 meter. So as far as the analytical study is concerned, they restricted the scope to a single span. As far as the implementation and strengthening is concerned, it was uh, for uh, it was supposed to be done for all based on the study to be carried out only for a single span and uh, modification of structural members components or introduction of new members as required for the new loading they also uh, thought of redesigning the entire rcc dex, dex lab and relaying it this was a part mandatory part of the scope then the scope also included the consult you see the scope of uh, SP Sigla construction, the contractor had two parts. One part was about the consultancy to assess analytically what is the situation, including the assessment of the fatigue residual life. And the second part was additional scope was based on the detailed inspection carried out by East Central Railway as well as the contractor. They were to replace or strengthen few based on the physical condition assessment. So these two parts are segregated. Uh, we were deeply involved in the analytical part of the study and uh, also uh, giving them the, uh, the detailed uh, drawings for the condition for the repair, which is proposed by East Central Railway, uh, you know, in terms of detailed engineering. But the basic decision was taken by the East Central Railway on many aspects. Uh, for example, additional plate was included above the stringer Bottom lateral bracing and angle and gussets were uh, sort of changed. Lateral bracing, angle and gussets of stringers, depending upon the situation, were uh, changed. Bottom angle of V bracing, but these are all secondary, you know, uh, strengthening. Uh, not on the pri you will notice that not on the primary member. Uh, additional scope included lateral bracing, angle and gussets of stringers to be replaced in situation where it is required. Bottom lateral bracing angle and gussets, as you can see. So these are some of the uh, photos uh, showing the various components of the of the structure. Uh, the time frame was twenty four months, and this chart shows uh, the methodology which uh, the contractor. I don't want to go into greater details of this. This is just for the information. Coming to structural assessment or estimation of demand, estimation of capacity and the fatigue life. Uh, you see the, uh, uh, the mandate for us was to see, to check. First of all, the mandate was to analyze the structure for the original loading and see whether the original design was okay or not. So we had to completely model the structure and uh, sort of do a reverse engineering. And fortunately for us, as I mentioned, the as built drawing had so much of detail that it helped us a great deal in uh, sort of revisiting and uh, sort of, you know, capturing the original design situation in our model. And we verified uh, uh, close to one, two percent, uh, all the details, the stresses that they arrived at was were matching with ours. The second was to uh, sort of take an improved situation where some of the loads have changed. For example, the track, they changed the sleeper from wooden to steel, they changed the rail weight and that resulted in a minor about 50 ton increase in load on the truss. Second is that they uh, wanted us to check for 25 ton 2008 loading, broad gauge loading 
uh, original design was based on BGML that they wanted us to change. And the third was uh, they wanted us to uh, check whether the revised highway loading on top, which is there in IRC code, whether it can take that load. And that load means uh, checking for class 70R, checking for congestion factor, and checking for the special vehicle, SV loading. And all these things were uh, carried out by us. The footwear loading, uh, more or less, there is no change in the original design and the, even the current IRS code. So there was no change. Wind load also, there was no change. Uh, seismic load, there has been significant change because the original design was with, with a constant factor of 0.1 for transverse and longitudinal direction. Co seismic coefficient uh, for vertical was taken half of that, whereas the current code, based on the time period, we found that uh, you know the figures are different. But fortunately, not much uh, increase in the transverse direction, but in the longitudinal direction, the coefficient is more. Breaking forces, there is an increase because of the uh, presence of, if you check for 70R uh, loading, then there is an increase in the force. Uh, railway also, there is an increase from 95 ton to 182 ton. Uh, raking force and all uh, are uh, more or less same. So uh, three load combinations we have checked uh, for the original load as well as for the revised. Uh, this is the revised new load combination, the original load combination. You can see more or less it is the same. Load combination is same, the loadings are different. Uh, we have adopted the working stress method uh, for the design check uh, because the even the current IRS steel bridge code recommends the same. Uh, and as I mentioned, SV loading not considered as uh, as we found that firstly, SV loading, it would not be safe. And uh, with after discussion with the client, they said, okay, you drop SV loading, we will have regulation to make sure that SV loading do not come here. And uh, so we did not check. Congestion factor has been considered in the new loading. And we also checked for the SP37 commercial vehicle loading, which is given uh, with 40% overloading from the uh, Motor Vehicle Act legal loads. And uh, this we have considered in the design, in addition to the 70R class A, et cetera. Uh, SP37 loading is, you know, this originally it was 49 ton, but as per the revision of Fort Motor Vehicle Act, it has become 55 ton now. So we have considered the 55 ton. Uh, this 49 is now read as 55, as far as our analysis is concerned. Uh, this is the 3D STAD model uh, where we have performed the analysis. We have calculated the demand, revised demand and the original. And each and every uh, case, we have calculated the capacity also. And we have the ratio is identified here. You can see in many cases, the demand, uh, the, uh, you know, demand versus capacity is becoming more than one, which has been you now flagged, uh, highlighted in color. If it is green color means the excess is less than 5%. So you can see some of the components is only just 1.010203, less than 5%, which is considered green. Yellow is 5% and above up to 10%. And red means uh, more than more than 15, uh, more than 10% uh, uh, like that. So you can see some of the components, uh, the overstressing is there if we consider the new loading. Uh, but what we found is that all these excess is primarily from consideration of 70R loading because the 70R has got this 20 ton breaking and that 20 ton breaking is creating a problem on the portal, uh, all the portals. And that is the cause. If we eliminate 70R wheel, then uh, these all these colors will go. And it is uh, vertical load is not a problem for the rail extra extra load, but the uh, main problem was the permission of 70 hour loading. So after a lot of discussion with uh, uh, with railways, East Central Railway, it was decided that uh, the repair and rehabilitation will be done by not considering 70 hour loading, but at the same time making some regulation at uh, site by uh, by which you prevent, you know, heavy loads to come. So, uh, 
members identified where demand versus capacity capacity is more than one is uh, just for the you know better understanding we have identified here in the graphical form that was a tabular form which i had shown earlier and it is clear that some of the uh, cross girders uh, at the roadway level and some of the stringers at the roadway level and in the main truss some of the diagonals are having problem if you consider 70 hour loading not otherwise as far as the bottom and top cord are concerned there is not uh, no problem as such even with 70 hour loading so yeah now next is the uh, bearing we found that there is an increase in the bearing load to the tune of about 10 percent and uh, therefore uh, uh, some of the bearings were also in little bad shape so it was decided to replace uh, these bearings uh, some of the bearings have already the you know the ones which are in bad shape are being replaced the other ones which are not in bad shape uh, we are in discussion with the central railway as to what is to be done uh, but there is an increase of to the tune of about 10 percent in the vertical load and uh, we need to really see whether uh, these bearings are to be replaced whole lock stock and barrel or not now i uh, uh, hand over to uh, mr shumantra senguptu my co-presenter who will talk about the assessment of the residual fatigue life for this uh, bridge over to you shumantra okay i'm sharing my screen thank you Is it visible? Yes, yes, visible. Okay, yes, fine. Yes. Fine. Uh, so, uh, so now we'll discuss on the residual fatigue life of this 64-year-old bridge. At the outset, what we will see that uh, what is the outcome of our uh, fatigue analysis. In this uh, slide, what you can see that for different members of the structure, member-wise, we have analyzed and we found that what is the residual fatigue life. In most of the cases, we are seeing there is a very a large amount of large years, number of years is uh, there, which is uh, the fatigue residual life for top cord, bottom cord, it is the tune of 500 years, diagonal 167, vertical 500 years, stringer, of course, it is directly carrying the load. So that is the reason why the residual fatigue life is less, which is 90 years, rail cross gutter 1500 years. But these figures, of course, are from our analytical uh, uh, calculation, which is coming from only fatigue criteria, that means for the fluctuating load. This does not uh, reflect the effect of weather, et cetera. So of course, these are some, some, some uh, analytical value, theoretical value, which we have arrived. And we'll see that how we have arrived to these values. So now if you come to connection, at central cross gutter and the other locations. So at central cross gutter at the rail level, the stringers are connected. Uh, every location stringers are connected, one side fixed, another side is free. But at the central cross gutter, at both sides it is fixed. And as a result, what we found, as per our analysis, it has it is failing. That means the fatigue life has been crossed. And at site also, we found that it has already been, the crack has appeared. So now, and roadway stringer, roadway cross that 22 years, 150 years. So we'll see that how we have arrived to these values. If you see what is fatty, as per IRS steel reach code, the process of a progressive localized permanent structural change occurring in a material subjected to conditions which produce fluctuating stresses and strain at some point or points and which may culminate in cracks or complete fracture after a sufficient number of fluctuations. That means if there is some fluctuate, fluctuating load, that means the varying load, this is causing some, some damage in the structure and with the good number of fluctuation, it is finally leading to crack or complete fracture. Now we'll try to uh, to get as much information as possible from this graph. This is basically stress versus number of cycle. And you can see some numbers here, 160, 140. And each colored graph corresponds to one number. 
So if you see that top graph, what is this? If you concentrate on point number one, what is this? This signifies that if one particular detail, sample detail of a, of a structure, of a section, if it is sustained with 160 MPa constant amplitude fluctuating load, stress range 160 MPa, and if it is given 2 million cycle of this constant amplitude 160 MPa stress, then it will fail. What is constant amplitude uh, uh, stress range? 160 MPa, that means from zero, it will reach to 160 MPa and it will come down to zero. So that is one count. And why it is constant? Because we are talking about only 160. This 160 figure is fixed constant. So this 160 MPa stress range, if it occurs for 2 million cycle, the this particular section, this particular detail will fail. If you come to point number two, which is on the same graph, this is suggesting if 118 MPa stress is applied on this particular detail, then it can sustain up to 5 million cycle. And after that, it will fail. Similarly, at point number three, if the stress range is 65 MPa, then it can sustain up to 100 million cycle, and after that, it will fail. So with reduction in the stress rate, the number of cycles is increasing, which is logical. So these graphs, individual graphs, are corresponding to different structural detail, and these details are given in the code. For example, if you see, we are we'll see two particular details. This is 160, the detail category, it is termed as detail category, which is say that this is a 160 MPa is the value, which is the constant amplitude stress range. And after 2 million cycle of operation, this will fail. And this is the, what is this? This is the simple plate or roll section. Same section, when it is connected by rivet, one end rivet, one end riveted connection, then at this junction, at this section, the detail category, the value will reduce. That means only 80 MP of stress it can sustain up to 2 million cycle. After that, it will fail. So this is the this is the part of the structure which we are discussing. The same detail is applicable for this structure. Similar, uh, why it is called SN curve? Because the stress versus number, number of cycles. So similar detail, earlier graph which we have seen that is for normal stress. Similar curve is available for shear stress. That means for some value of stress and for 2 million cycle, it will fail corresponding to shear. So now, we have talked about constant amplitude stress range. But in real life, the stress history is extremely complicated because when a train or a vehicle passes over a structure or a bridge, then if you consider one particular member, suppose stranger, so that stringer is having a huge complicated stress history, which is not at all a constant amplitude stress. And this is just one sample. So this is the stringer and where one particular train has moved over the stringer. And for that particular train load, so much of variation of the stress has occurred. So this is suppose 25. From 25, it has come down to zero. Again, it is 25. It has come down to say 20 MPa. This way it is going on. And at one point of time, it has gone up to say, 70, 75 MPa, and then it has come down to 25. So this stress history is not at all showing any constant amplitude stress variation. So from the, here, we have to finally add up, we have to add up some theory, which is giving us how we can do the cumulative damage assessment. That is what exactly we have done, and we'll see that. Now, there are various loads suggested by a BGML road, which is, is a locomotive load, and the trailing the train load is 7.67 ton per meter. Similarly, MBD load, modified broad gauge load, some locomotive loads are there, and the trailing train load is 8.25 ton per meter. For 25 ton 2008, this is a 25 ton axle load for the loco, and the trailing or train load is 9.33 ton per meter. What are these loads? These loads are used for the new design of any structure. And why we are using this load for the new design? Because this is the load which is the maximum load which may come on the structure. And our target is to design the structure, new structure, so that the maximum load it can sustain. But in case of um, fatigue life assessment, remaining fatigue life assessment, 
this kind of load is not adequate. What we have to see is what is the actual load which has passed over the bridge. So that we have to check, that we have to see, and then we have to see what is the complicated stress history it has experienced. Now, so that is the reason code has suggested actual load type and what code is saying that it is a fatigue loading. They are terming it as a fatigue loading. And they are saying that the fatigue assessment is to be done for 50% of the impact load specified in bridge loads. Why 50%? When we are designing the new structure, we are considering 100% impact because the new structure is to be designed for the maximum load which is coming on the structure. So as a result, the 100% impact, which is the maximum one, may come on the structure, we have to consider that. But when you are assessing the fatigue life, then not for each uh, train, each load when it is passing over the bridge, it is not that the 100% impact will be there because the impact factor depends on a lot of factors. One of the factors is uh, uh, the speed, uh, the many other factors. So it is not that whenever a train is passing over a bridge, 100% impact is coming. So code is suggesting some value between zero to 100%. Code is suggesting the 50% impact factor we have to consider when you are assessing for fatigue. Different type of loads are there, which has been which which are which are recommended by code. Type one, type two, type five, up to type 10, 10 are there. Each load is showing the total length of the uh, type of the load, total load that's 930 ton, and the wheel configuration. Because after all, we have to do the analysis considering this wheel configuration, and we have to do the live load analysis, and we have to see that what is the stress history is coming over the one part, that, that particular uh, section which we are analyzing. This is as per old code, total 10 number of 10 types of loads are there. Similarly, for new code, that means 25 ton loading 2008, there are also 10 such loads are there, 10 such type of the uh, trains are there. And these are different loads, different uh, wheel uh, position, wheel configuration. So there are also total 10 types of loads. So which are to be considered in our analysis of the fatigue. Now, if we just compare, if we just have one comparison between BGML, MBD, and 25 ton 2008, 7.67 is the ton per meter, 8.25 is ton per meter, 9.33 ton per meter for 25 ton 2008. So these are more or less compar comparable. Why I am suggesting that these are more, more or less comparable? Because now we are assessing with respect to 25 ton 2008, but actual load is BGML, which is BGML and then, then MBD load has also passed through the bridge. But we are assessing with respect to the 25 ton 2008. So if these are comparable, our factor is also there, which has been taken care in our final analysis result. Now, the complicated stress history is there when a train, a vehicle is passing over a bridge. And if you see that, if you consider one particular element of the bridge, and if you see that what is the stress history, Suppose this is the particular stress history, one vehicle is passing over the bridge and one particular section, this is the stress history. And how to calculate, how to count, and how to finally assess that what is the damage has occurred. So if this is the stress history, there are two different methods that they are for counting the cycle. One is reservoir method and other is the rainfall method. So we have gone by reservoir method. What is the reservoir method? Reservoir method is saying that if we consider the topmost point of the maximum stress value, which has occurred in the, uh, which, has, which you can see from the stress uh, history and the bottommost point, the minimum stress point. Then if we consider this as a reservoir and this reservoir is leaking to the bottommost point. So what is happening? This is the topmost point of the reservoir. When the water is coming up to point I, so then this is becoming one isolated reservoir. When the water is coming at point H, this particular location is becoming an isolated reservoir. And when we are coming to point G, this is becoming one isolated reservoir. And from the top to the bottommost point, this is separate reservoir. What we are finally uh, coming to the conclusion that if this is the reservoir, then we have to, we can we can say that this trace history is showing from G to F, which is G to F is 10 to 10, so 20 MPa. This is the 20 MPa of stress fluctuation has occurred, which is we are getting from this stress history. At point E, the stress 
uh, range is from 30 MPa to say minus 15. So 30 plus 15, 45 MPa has occurred. Similarly, from H to D, it is 15 and 5, so again 20 MPa. And from I to C, it is again say 20 to 5, so 25 MPa. So this particular stress history, what it is giving us, it is giving us, it is saying us 20 MPa of stress constant stress range has occurred two times. This is 20, this is 20. Here it is 20, here it is 20. And 45 MPa of stress range has occurred once, 25 MPa of stress range has occurred once. So from this figure, now our target is to find out for this kind of a variation of stress, what is the accumulated damage? That is our target. How we can do the, do the calculation of the accumulated damage? One train minus rule has been applied. They have given this, this uh, uh, theory. So N1 is the number of occurrence of the stress strain. For example, here 20 MPa is the stress strain which has occurred twice. When we are considering this particular stress history, 20, now 20 MPa stress strain has occurred once. So here N1 is one, sorry, N1 is two. And the capital N1, what is capital, capital N1? Capital N1 is the, that particular number of cycle corresponding to 20 MPa stress range the section will fail. We can see from this, suppose here, what we are getting 20, 45, 20, 20, 25. So 20 stress range has occurred twice, 45 MPa stress range has occurred once, 25 MPa stress range has occurred once. So when you are considering 20 MPa stress range, then N1 is two, and then we have to find out what is N, capital N1 at the denominator. We can calculate the capital in, uh, in, in the denominator. For example, we have to, first we have to select what is the detail category? For example, say let us consider say this lowest point 36 is the detail category, 36. Now 20 MP, if you do the calculation for 20 MP, which is coming between 14 and 26, and somewhere here will be there, which is giving us a value between 5 million cycle to 100 million cycle. So somewhere we have to, some explicit equations are there. We don't have to go by this uh, graph. So this figure is somewhat safe, say for example, it is 50 MP, 50 million cycle. So capital N1 will be 50 million. So what is the accumulated damage for damage for this particular stress history? A small N1 is two, capital N1 is 50 million. So it's almost zero, but this capital N1 is two. When we are considering this particular stress history, this stress history may occur say 100 times, 1000 times or 1 million times. So automatically that figure is to be multiplied in the numerator. Similarly, for say 45 MPa, this has occurred once, so N1 will be one and capital N1 will be from this. We can say that it is above 36 somewhere here, 45, and corresponding to that, our number of cycle at which it, the, this detail will fail will be some value less than 2 million, say 1 million. So, so here N1 will be 1 million. So that will give us the cumulative damage for this 45 MPa stress range. So this particular stress history, from this particular stress history, we can finally estimate what is the total accumulated damage has occurred. So that is the basic thing which has applied, which we have applied in our calculation. So this is now what we have to see that the, uh, the traffic model of 25 ton load that has been suggested by code, here is. So what is this? This is a different type of present type of load which we have already seen, and they have said that different type of classification of traffic depending on that one particular stretch of the track. So here, say type one load, 900 ton is a total load, and GMT corresponding GMT is 0 0.33. What is how we can calculate corresponding GMT 0 0.33? This 900 ton is the total load of this type one, and one value one one train per day, if it passes over the bridge, then over the year, the total GMT will be 900 divided multiplied by 365, which corresponding to 0 0.33 GMT. So one train passing off the bridge, through the bridge per day corresponds to 0 0.33 GMT. And they are saying that for different type of track location, so heavy freight, if it is heavy freight, then three number of such uh, type of train will pass every day. So automatically 3 into 0.32 will be 1 GMT. And this way they are suggesting different type of train corresponding to that particular category of the traffic 
So if it is heavy traffic, this is, these are the number of trains and these are the corresponding number of type of the vehicle. Mixed traffic, these are the number of uh, trains corresponding to different types. So finally, what it is giving that if it is heavy traffic, then 101 MP uh, GMT. If it is a mixed traffic, 70 GMT. If it is sour one, 59 or 60 GMT. Mixed traffic, this is 40 GMT. Here we have to add up finally some someone, some uh, category. So here, after uh, consulting with uh, the concerned railway ECR, we have adopted this 70 GMT because this is, we have considered as a mixed traffic line. So once we know this, what we have done simply is so this type of the road, this, this say type one load we have, all that wheel configuration, and we just uh, run the train, the live load analysis we have done over the bridge, and we have seen the, what is the stress, stress uh, history, and that stress history will be multiplied by what is the, the number? What is that number? There is a six numbers are there per day, and that will be multiplied by 365 per year, and that will be multiplied by number of years, which has already the it has sustained. Now, when we are saying that this reservoir method to calculate the reservoir method, uh, the, uh, the number of cycles through reservoir method, it's a very uh, complicated complicated calculation means it takes a lot of time. It's not a complicated thing, but it takes a lot of time if we want to do it manually. So we have to depend on, we have to create some program or we have to uh, say we get some program for this calculation. So we have used, we have got some program in MATLAB. So this is giving, this is actual stress history. And what is this number? 137970. This is the number of occurrence of this stress history, which is coming from Six, this is a, uh, say, train type one. So we have seen already the train type one corresponding to that six number of a uh, train will pass every day. So six numbers of part, six numbers per day, 65 days and 63 years. The It has already sustained 64 years have passed, but the time when we analyzed this, we did this analysis, that was 63, that was last year we did it, 63 years. So finally the figure is 137970. So this trace is three, when is corresponding to type one train is passing through the bridge. And in spring year, this is the stress history and this stress history is, is occurring, it has occurred, or it is occurring for 137970 times. And finally, it is giving the accumulated damage, this is the accumulated damage value, 0 0.04. That means for type one vehicle, it is passing over the bridge over this many number of cycle, number of cycle and it cumulative damage is 0 0.04. So this way we have calculated for all types, type one, say type two, then type three, like this. So if you see that type, uh, uh, say type one, type one damage is 0 0.04, type two damage is 0 0.1, type three damage is 0 0.12, this way it is going on. Now we'll just concentrate on one particular, this is a type two and type three. The other type rather will concentrate on say type three and type six. Uh, so type three, you see that here the stress values are to the tune of say 40 MPM. And at the last, it has gone to the, it, the, the, the some spike is there. So it is to the tune of say 80 MPM. So there, thus it accumulated damage is 0 0.12. But if you see this one, here the maximum stress is to the tune of 80 MPM and it is continuously happening. But here also the, the cumulative damage is 0 0.1. This suggests that this cumulative damage does not depend on the maximum stress, rather it depends on fluctuation of stress. That means here, here it is fluctuating from say 40 MPa to 0 MPa. Here also it is fluctuating from 80 MPa to 40 MPa. So the fluctuation, fluctuation is almost same. And that is the reason why the cumulative damage for both for these two types of vehicles, although one these type six is giving much higher stress, absolute stress much higher, but the accumulated damage for type three and type six are more or less same. So this way we have analyzed for all the uh, types, which is giving the direct, uh, direct stress and the shear stress, is, uh, stress uh, accumulated damage is also there. And this shear stress accumulated damage we found that is more or less zero everywhere, very small type two, type three, type six, type seven, type eight. And finally, this is the table which is showing us the uh, uh, overall result. So type one in flexure, the accumulated damage is 0 0.04. For type two, it is 0 0.1, type three, 0 0.12, type six, 0 0.1. So if we just add it up, 
it comes to 0 0.7476. Similarly, for shear, it, it is coming to 0 0.0029. For shear, it is very less. Now, this 0 0.7476, this corresponds to 63 years. Fine. But we have considered 70 GMT in our analysis. So that is the, that way we have find, found out what is the number of opponents. But we have to see now what is the actual frame has passed. What is the actual history of the loading in the bridge? And um, uh, it is uh, uh, for railway bridge, this is very, uh, the, the Advantageous thing is that railway keep all these records. In case of road, it will be very, it is generally very difficult to assess uh, fatigue life of any existing bridge because in road day we don't have any such uh, record of the past load which has passed over the bridge. So now you see that the, the bridge was uh, opened in 1959, but we have got the record from 81, 81 to 82. The record is 2 MP, 2 G, uh, GMT, 82, 83. This is 3.6 GMT, 83, 84, 4 uh, GMT. So this way, it is going on. Say around say 90, it has increased to 18 GMT. If you come to say around say 2000, it is still 21 GMT. So if you come to 2007, 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12, or, and 13, 14, up to 15, these here somehow huge number of train has passed through the bridge where, where the GMT per year GMT is to the tune of 80, 90. Again, it has come down. So it all, uh, uh, these are all recorded in the uh, in railway, and we have got it from ECR. So finally, what we are getting, we don't have the record be, uh, before eighty one. So what we have considered that as from the for the initial years eighty one to eighty six, eighty seven, we are getting the average is say say five GMT. We considered so before eighty one, the five GMT uh, train has passed per year. So with that, if we do the average value of the GMT, what we are finding that 22 GMT on average train has passed over this bridge from 59 to 2022, suppose. So now here, what we have to do, we have done the analysis calculation for 70 GMT, for which our cumulative damage is 0 0.74 for a rail stranger. We have to simply reduce it from by Factor 22 by 70, which is coming to 0 0.23 uh, cumulative damage. So finally, what we are arriving that for that for railway stranger, cumulative damage of this particular bridge is 0 0.23. Now, how to assess that? What is the uh, residual life? So 0 0.23 cumulative damage has already occurred. So it will be the fatigue life will be over if the cumulative damage is one. So still the remaining uh, damage is one minus 0 0.23, so 0 0.77. So we have simply calculated we have to, what we have to do, the simple calculation that 0 0.23 damage has already occurred with considering 22 GMT over the 63 years period. Now remaining 0 0.77 uh, damage should have has, has to be occurred. For how many years, but not for 20 GMT, we have considered here 50 GMT because we are considering that the remaining years is for the remaining years, it is 50 GMT load will pass. So that is finally giving us the 90 years. So this way we have calculated all the members. Now, just uh, we have seen in, the, in our first slide that uh, that. Uh, uh, at one location it has failed, that is the connection has failed, so that will go directly to that location. This is the cross gutter, this is the stringer. Once the, this side of the stringer is uh, free, this side of the stringer is fixed. What is happening when the load is coming in both the stringer, or rather in one stringer, when coming load is in this stringer, this is simply supported. When the load is this side, this is fixed, but as this is not fixed, the string, this cross gutter will rotate. It is allowed to rotate, and it, as it is allowed to rotate, this will no longer uh, behave as a fixed fixity. So, as a result, this is both the stringers are behaving as a simply supported. But in this case, where, where the central location, both the stringers are fixed. So, as a result, when the both sides are loaded, the cross gutter is not able to build, and as a result, on the stringer at the end, fixed end moment is coming, which is the reason behind the crack which has appeared at the at the, at, the, at the weld, which has been connected 
between the stringer and the face plate. So here, this is the location, and this is the stringer where we have calculated uh, the stringer location, the stringer section, 577 years. But when you are estimating the that is connection weld, how we have estimated this is the stringer and this is the weld. We have segregated the weld, and we found that what is the, uh, that size, uh, that section modulus of the stringer itself, and what is the section modulus of this weld. We found that almost 3.5 is the ratio between the section modulus of this of the stringer section and weld section. So 3.5 times more stress is coming in the weld. So simply this is the same calculation we have done. So we found that if we consider the total load up to the 63, 63 years, accumulated damage is coming 4.14, which suggests that it has already crossed its own life. We have tried to calculate one, one very interesting thing that if 4.4 is the accumulated damage as on date, then what is the when the accumulated damage has occurred when that that when the accumulated damage is one when this has occurred so this we tried to uh, find uh, uh, find out we found that 2005 is the year at which the accumulated damage is coming one that means at 2005 the crack should have occurred at site ECR they have observed the crack around 2011 which is a very close the analytical value and the real life situation. This is the location which has been uh, now we are proposing some uh, modification. And this way we have the rail cross gutter, bottom cord, top cord, bottom cord, and finally we have arrived this one. Next, we'll go to the uh, intervention proposed. Uh, basically, uh, we have seen that all members of the railway level are adequate for revised loading. All members at the road level are adequate for re uh, revised loading if it if 70 year loading is uh, excluded uh, from the roadway load, all the trust members are adequate for the new loading if class 70 year loading is excluded. And it has been decided by ECR that a 70 year loading in to be considered. Uh, and with the above condition, only those members which are already the distressing has occurred, we have proposed to give some proposal there. That means the, the rail, the rail stringer condition which we have just seen. Then we'll see that one uh, diagonal crack, uh, which has occurred in the 30 meter stringer and some inclined member. We'll see that one by one. So this is the location which we have just discussed. So both ends are fixed. So what we have done is we have removed the fixity. We have given the, some seating arrangement and we have put some, some bolts, fixed bolts, so that there is so no movement in the lateral direction. And this will relieve the stringer from this fixity. And as a result, there should not be any further damage in the through because of the uh, fatty. Some cracks, the, these cracks have been observed in the 30 meter gutter, 30 meter stringer. So this is, we have analyzed and we found that the uh, principal stress in this direction is occurring and which is, which is, which is crossing the, the limit, even the fatty limit is also crossed. So what we have done, what we have proposed, we have proposed some additional plate as the wave has been cracked, we have proposed some additional plate at the both sides this way. So there is some pack plate is there and over that pack plate, the entire part of the, this additional plate has been given and with that, the new HS3 bolt has been provided. Mm -hmm. Some of the members which have been uh, damaged because of the uh, high, uh, oversized vehicle, so this is, the, this is the, the cross members, the bracing members at this location, it has needed by these oversized members and like this, this has happened. So we have proposed that these are to be replaced. And relaying of dead slab, uh, relaying of deck slab is going on now. One side is obstructed where the, the we are we are allowing the vehicle, and this side we are working. This is the actual picture where this side work is going on, and this side uh, vehicle is allowed. And once it is done, this side will be uh, work will be start at this side, and this will be open for the traffic. And finally, both sides will be open. So we'll come to the summary then. So now I will hand over to uh, Womik sir for the concluding remarks. So I'm stopping my Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay, I, no, I have to share just a minute, just a minute. I, you oh, have to share. <laughs> I have to share, right, right, right. Yes, is it visible? Yeah, it is visible. Is it visible to others? I think it is visible. So uh, I come to the final summary and uh, conclusion uh, next 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 slide next and the next so basically you know in summary what we can say is the original loading was uh, bgml of 1926 high wheel loading single 
lane of class AA or two lanes of class A. And all members we found to be adequate based on our own analytical investigation. And when we did the analytical study, we have assumed that the cross section, all the cross sections are intact. We have not uh, considered any loss of uh, area. Uh, and uh, our visual inspection also, by, by and large, uh, we found that the, generally there is not much of corrosion on the main members. There are some corrosion uh, indication on the bracings, you know, which are directly coming under the stringers where the railway passes. And uh, of course, those members continuously are being uh, replaced and strengthened by uh, by the maintenance uh, people of Eastern East Central Railway. Uh, the new loading, we found that all members are adequate except the roadway cross girders and stringers. And uh, since this would involve uh, many uh, members to be uh, sort of strengthened, we are in discussion with East Central Railway and. They proposed us not to consider 70 hour loading, though strictly going by the code, uh, you cannot really exclude 70 hour loading. That's not the way normally we do. But this is a special case. This We are talking about a bridge which is 64 year old. We are talking about a bridge where two new bridges are coming up, which will uh, definitely relieve this once they are completed in another next one or two years. So these factors, definitely uh, are to be considered while taking a decision and therefore I think East Central Railway is uh, right in my view to take this call that uh, just it, if it is a matter of 70 hour loading then we will do regulation of the of the load on the top and uh, rather than you know doing detailed strengthening of many members so this is what is the final next next slide please now, uh, you see, in conclusion, I would say that working for repair and rehabilitation of Mukama Bridge was for us a huge learning experience. We are still learning on many counts. Firstly, we learned how important it is for engineers to write articles about the project they are involved in for the sake of posterity and not only for the sake of posterity, but also for future repair, rehabilitation and atrophy. Uh, you see, imagine uh, we would not have been in the position where we are if we had not uh, got this article. And there are many bridges uh, in India where you do not find any uh, document or any uh, detail when you start repair and rehabilitation. Therefore, I think it's a very good practice uh, that engineers should write articles about the project which they complete uh, for the sake of posterity and for future repairs. Because these articles, once published, they can be easily accessed even after 50 years, 60 years down the line. We have learned how all the, uh, what all information should be included in the as-built drawing of the project. And uh, I think I'm sure in future projects, uh, at least in our office, we will make sure that the as-built drawing, we include these kind of information. But I think in our IRC guidelines, we should uh, replicate this kind of information uh, also, try to put it as a mandatory requirement. There's a huge learning on determination of fatigue service life, the elements. We have been immensely educated on this aspect. Uh, relaying of the entire deck concrete was being uh, you know, mandated by Central Railway. Uh, if this was not done, perhaps uh, we could have also thought of other options rather than uh, completely relaying, we could have perhaps thought of also strengthening, but this was this possibility was not there for us. Uh, bearings are being replaced for the main uh, trust bridge, uh, which uh, which because one because of the little bit of overloading uh, which is now coming, and also in some of the cases bearings are not in good shape. That is the reason. Next. So this is the last one. This is the last okay. one. Uh, okay, no. Okay. No, as far as the substructure and foundation is concerned, we have done the analysis and we find that substructure and foundations are safe with the new loading. So nothing needs to be done. Uh, these actually well foundation as well as the piers are quite robust, as you can see from the diagram itself. Uh, they are very robust and therefore in the long run, you know, these, uh, these have very long uh, life and Therefore, there is no issue. It has been decided by ECR that the following load will be considered in the design. As I mentioned, 
MG, MG, MBG train loading 25 ton 2008 and class A two lane or double A or commercial vehicles given in SP 37 and the congest congestion factor loading as per the amended version. That's all. Thank you very much for patient hearing. It has been a long lecture. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I'll stop hearing. Uh, great. Uh, both of the speakers have talked so well. And it's really a wonderful learning experience of uh, I mean, uh, doing conditional survey and then coming out whether the structure, uh, which element is safe or not safe. And then particularly this, uh, 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 I would say, fatigue uh, thing, uh, then uh, working out the fatigue service life of uh, all elements. Uh, I tell you, a wonderful lecture, and I'm sure everybody listening uh, will get benefit. Only thing I'll request the movies up that it can be published in our structural engineering digest so that uh, more people can go through and then uh, get uh, information about such important. Uh, see the old structure uh, still. Uh, no corrosion in the uh, uh, main uh, members, and then uh, foundation and the substructure is same. See the quality of work at that time. I think we have to learn that uh, future construction also. We have to yeah. focus on the durability part so that the structure is safe for the intended design life. So yeah. uh, thank you, thank you once again. To everybody who has assembled, our next monthly lecture will be on 28th of Dr. Uh, Dhawan, Dr. Dhawan, there is there are yeah. few questions in the Q and A box. If you have time, please continue. Uh, Sumantro, would you like to take uh, those questions and uh, maybe uh, we can answer some of them? I have already answered uh, uh, to them. But if you certain things are related to fatigue, so if you can take up those questions and answer. Okay, let me let me just go through. Uh, you, in fact, you okay. can take up all the questions to answer. Oh, if yes. you think my input Please. is required, I can do that. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, the first question, what I what I am getting from Hegre sir, that during eighty seven to ninety five, eighty seven to ninety five, the GMT seems to be almost three to five times. Then. Onwards, it is reducing. Any inquiry was made with railway as for it is no. Actually, we have not done that thing uh, because we are we were interested to see that what is the fatigue residual fatigue life. So uh, because this is not going to affect our residual fatigue life uh, assessment. So that's why we have not inquired that why it has happened. But due to some reason, it has happened. Okay. Uh, what about the fatigue? Verification for combined roadway and train load. Okay, that rail is suggesting that if it is a roadway come train a rail load, then fatigue can be considered separately only for the train load. We don't have to consider because after all, this effect on the uh, overall truss and on the train rail level uh, floor, the effect of road is roadway is not that much. So as a result, the code is suggesting accordingly that we can use only the train load. We have considered the floor load floor at the at the road location that means the cross gutter and the stringers that has been done separate separately for roadway. But when you are considering the overall bridge and the and the and the, the, the floor of the train, then we are considering all that only the train load, which is as per that as per the code. Fixed stringers could physically fatigue verification at yes the lab actually this is part of the part of our, uh, uh, in the tender, in the scope, we have this. So this is under uh, discussion. This is being done by CSIR, ACRC, uh, Chennai. So the talk is going on, discussion is going on with them. So how it has been, it is to be done. So what, where, from where the material to be uh, uh, taken, because after all, any member will not be suitable for for test. We have to get the the, uh, the uh, location where the maximum stress has occurred. For example, the stringer and the mid span of the stringer in the in the in the flange, that is the member which we, which we have to take for laboratory testing. So that way, the, in the in the in the 
uh, support location also. So this discussion is going on. Uh, Lakshmi Parameshwar, why uh, there are cracks in some of the members? What measure to stop the crack for propagation? There, there are two locations the cracks appeared. That is, one is the uh, continuous stringer location at the mid span of the mid at the mid span location at the rail level. So that we have already analyzed and we have found that the the reason behind. Similarly, the crack has been seen in in the in the wave at the top portion of the wave at the support location for 30 meter uh, apple span. And that has also been analyzed, and we found that this is the principal stress is more, and as a result, for the main stress and for the fatigue stress, it has paid. I want to further comment that durability of the bridge components should be compared with the increased quality and strength of material prescribed now. Well, let me take that question from Sina okay, Saab. Okay. Uh, okay. N.K. Sina Saab's point. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. This is a this is this is a very interesting point which he has made. What we always find is you know the old bridges, they uh, they are ser serving uh, and they are uh, uh, proving to be much more durable than the relatively the new bridges where you ha you you use very high quality of uh, material yeah, and uh, so uh, there are many reasons for that. Uh, I think that will be another long story, but uh, I think it has something to do with all, uh, two, two, three things. One is the material also, because there is a lot of debate going on as to you know earlier we used to use lower grade concrete uh, with uh, cement, uh, which is uh, you know 33 grade or 43 grade, whereas today. We are using high performance, high grade uh, cement with very fine particle. Their behavior, uh, uh, and moreover, the quality of inspection, quality of control at site has significantly changed over the years. And that, there are several reasons we can have a separate debate on that. But yes, this is a matter of concern that today, even if we, even when there is increased quality and strength in in uh, in projects, we are finding that the bridges are proving to be less durable, and one needs to really go into details about it. Okay, one question is for why rainfall method has not been applied. Actually, both the things are applicable, rainfall and reservoir method, but it depends on the stress history. In some stress history, if we go for go by rain, uh, reservoir method, that gives an easier easier way of calculation, and some for some stress history, if you go by rainfall method that gives us easier way of calculation. But finally, we'll arrive to the same value. Whether rehabilitation scheme has been implemented, uh, any load testing proposed? No, rehabilitation scheme is being implemented now. Yeah, but is there any load testing proposed uh, subsequent to the uh, repair and rehabilitation, Subantro? Yes, it is. It will be done. It will be done. Mm -hmm. It will be done. Mm -hmm. Likhan okay. is saying uh, Likhan is saying that adequate codal provision are specified for railway bridges to ensure their actual integrity. However, the Indian Road IRC currently lacks equivalent residual fatigue life guideline. Yes, IRC actually this is the for road bridge equivalent residual fatigue life assessment itself will be very difficult task because we do not have any stress history. That that load record is not there. So whatever in in our case also we have said that the it is 22 years is the load is. Uh, residual fatigue life of stringer of the road level. So that is based on some assumption. We considered some assumed uh, 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 that uh, stress history uh, based on the what code is suggesting. But this is not a very very accurate what we can compare with with respect to road, rail rail uh, level. Oh, okay, someone in the chat box. Uh... Uh, said that whether we can share the paper which is unique and one uh, it will be helpful to us uh, so i think it can be shared uh, uh, i will give it to our secretariat and those who are interested can can get a copy of this uh, article which Great. we have taken from the institution i hope i presume that there is no copyright issue on that i will uh, confirm from the representative uh, Mr. Day, and then only I will give it tomorrow. Subject to, is... subject to no problem of, you know, sharing it, I will share it. 
So one question is whether wind and earthquake are taken for this damage calculation. This damage is for fatigue and fatigue is for the stress, fluctuating stress. And that fluctuating stress is occurring only for the, for the live load. For wind and uh, seismic, this is not fluctuating stress or rather it is not a continuous. It is a once in a lifetime, once in a uh, 10 years, once in a five years, this is occurring. So as a result, number of cycle is much, much less. So that's the, that is not going to create any kind of fatigue damage. Uh, just to supplement, so Subantra, yes, what you yes. are saying, yes, yes. See, it depends on the type of structure. Mm -hmm. If you, I mean, for a bridge of this nature, a long span bridge, 120 meter span, the live load fatigue will be much, 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 much more predominant as compared to the fatigue due to wind. Whereas mm -hmm. if you take, for example, a signage structure, Mm -hmm. uh, there, the wind fatigue will be important, I mean, uh, uh, rather than any other thing. So, right. for this type of structure, wind is not important as far as fatigue is concerned. Uh, right. And at the same time, the, the kind of structure which is uh, holding, etc., there the wind is the predominant load. But there also, the number of cycle is much less if we compare with, if we see that SN carb, for which it is to be, it will be damaged in fatigue. So that's also, uh, that is also true. Uh, the end recur fatigue calculation, end recur fatigue calculation, uh, okay, end recur uh, at the road level, that is coming at the road level, not at the, at the, at the rail level. And we have not found any, any uh, when we have analyzed for road, we have not found any, any damage there for fatigue in, in recur. There is a suggestion by Mr. Ghoshal that IS Trakti should encourage publication of books in bridges. Thank you, sir. Uh, we will <laughs> definitely consider this. Uh, I just want to also share one anecdote. Uh, you know, when this flyer came uh, and distributed, uh, Professor Prem Krishna ji uh, sent a mail to me stating that when he was in the final year in IIT Roorkee in uh, BSc Civil Engineering, he visited this project that was under construction at that time. And he was very excited. I don't know whether he is attending this. In which case, uh, if Mr. Vikas can put him in the panel, maybe we can hear something from Professor Prem mm. Krishna. No, no, sir. He is not attending, sir. Okay, he is not attending. Fine. We got similar question that effect of wind and seismic and corresponding uh, the damage effect. So the same because the damage fatigue damage is basically occurs for from from live load so that is i think more or less us all questions we have more or less we have okay time. so, so dr dhawan you can now uh, great <laughs> i would say uh, bobi sahab and uh, sumantra sergupta ji wonderful uh, presentation and i'm sure Everybody listening will definitely get benefit, and then this recording is also there, uh, which can be I mean, heard once again if anybody wants. So thank you once again to both of the speakers, and I'm sure the persons attending the webinar will definitely get benefit. So with that uh, remark, let's conclude uh, the, the session. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you thank once you. again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you uh, Dr. Okay. Dhawan. Thank you. Thank okay. you all. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay.